I wanted to speak with you about your filming process with following Harry because you're also an editor as well. So I would love to tell you more, like, how were you able to navigate directing and editing? I think that all directors should be editors <laughs> in film because that's how the story gets put together in the cutting room. You know, the, the truth is, because I've been doing this for 45 years and I've edited other people's films. And I find that a lot of the people I've worked with have no idea <laughs> about how to put a story together. They have great ideas. They're brilliant. But, you know, a film can't go on for 25 hours. I think it's harder to be a camera person director and shoot and direct, which is what I, I used to do a long time ago. And I realized that I was removing myself too much from the subject and from what was really going on. So I, I, I like to not have the wall of the camera. You know, there's incredible intimacy when you're filming and you, you know, but, but it, but you're not getting a fuller picture. You know, you're in, in the, the microscopic rather than the macro. So I think it, although so many great films have been directed and shot by the same person. But I think that if there's a question about the difficulty of being a director and editor, I think that combination is probably the best combination. Because I'm, I know when I'm directing, I'm thinking, oh, she's saying this would be so nice to have that <laughs> to tell the story. Bowman Harry in doing a film that has so many layers to this, and directing and editing. How are you able to navigate deadlines for yourself, and also knowing how really to conduct, you know, a timeline for yourself? Well, the thing about deadlines, <laughs> which is like a curse word um, <laughs> um you know for many years i was making this film with no funding so i had no deadlines i had no funding so i just kept on shooting i i, I would you know borrow from this film to you know fit in shoots here and uh, my my wonderful crews would work for very little and uh, would always be there and available and it wasn't until i got my funding in the last two years of making this film, that deadlines even had anything to do with it. I had some internal deadlines in that when I started it, I thought this would be so good to get Obama elected, but I couldn't finish it in time. Then it would be so good to keep Trump from getting elected the first go round. It didn't make that one. And then it was getting Biden elected over Trump. And the film just wasn't there. It just, I couldn't really put it together. I couldn't figure out how to put it together. I would cut little segments. I did send out little, little pieces, little four minute pieces to be used at community meetings and for this and that. But a whole film, it just wasn't there yet. And uh, it wasn't until I got my final funding uh, two years ago that uh, I saw, well, now I have the money that I can, I can shoot what I need to shoot when I need to shoot it, which will escalate the process. And I can sit down and just edit and just disappear into the edit. But with that money came deadlines <laughs> because suddenly I was beholden to the person who was paying for it. And he had some visions. He said, well, you can do it in six months. I'm going to edit in six months and we can qualify for the Oscar. And uh, fortunately, Frankie Nassau came on board to be the producer, and he's someone I'd worked with over the years, and it was just wonderful. I knew him when he was quite young. He's much younger than me, and but he's a wonderful producer, very caring, and he acted as a, a good shield. And so when I said, there's no way I'm not going to sign a contract that says six months, I can sign a contract, but you will be suing me because I will not do it in six months. And after 10 years of working on this film, I'm not cutting it in six months. I need time to think about it. It needs to live. And, you know, it's, it's, I hate to use the word, but it's art. You're creating something, <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not a commercial. So uh, deadlines would come and go and I would be able to talk myself around or dance myself around the deadlines until we decided really we should get it out because it wasn't going to be a series. I didn't have money to do a series. The temperature in the country has changed in terms of streaming and everything. I'm going to get it done for the 
2024 election. So I gave myself the deadline. And then Tribeca comes along and Paula, Paula Weinstein, who I know very well and who I had been in the last couple of years making little films for her um, award, the Harry Belafonte Voices for Social Activism Award. Each time she would give it, I would make a little film to go with the award ceremony, a film about Harry. This time she thought it would be so great to have the whole film and make the event be the film and the award ceremony. You've come from a background like, um, I believe you have your master's in anthropology. I had my master's in filmmaking. I, and my undergraduate was anthropology. I studied with Margaret Mead at mm -hmm. Columbia and I was in pre-med before that. Oh, so wow. I've navigated a couple of different <laughs> different <laughs> routes to, to where I am now. So how did you transition from pre-med to filmmaking? come from a family of physicians and uh, psychiatrists. And uh, so it just was always in my mind that that's what I would do. But my parents were very uh, creative. So every our house was always filled with art and artists. And so film is always a love of mine. But, but I, I always felt that I had to really make a difference in the world and give something back to life. And medicine seemed like such a logical thing for me. And I... I love science and I love the idea of healing, but I didn't, uh, but once I got to college, I thought, I didn't think I, I was afraid I wouldn't be a good doctor because I'm, I'm too emotional, you know? So there was always that dichotomy of, of art and, and science. And uh, so I, when I came to understand who I was and that I didn't think the fear of not being a good doctor, uh, I discovered anthropology, which I just loved. And with Margaret Mead, I realized that, because I love the, I think there's so much power in storytelling yeah. and knowing about other cultures. And my, my father, the doctor took, uh, he took care of the community and, and didn't charge anybody. He got paid, we always joked, you got paid in spaghetti basically. And, but to make money so we could have the comfortable life we had, he took care of, all the sailors who came into the port of New York. Mm -hmm. And so when you'd walk into his office, they, first you'd walk past the community who was all over the place in the office. And then you go into the back room and there'd be a Maasai warrior and someone in a turban. And there were seamen from all over the world. And my father and mother both spoke multiple languages. And, mm -hmm. and so I was introduced to so many cultures and their stories. And I would sit there as a kid and talk to them. And I was just, I became so fascinated about other lives, the other, other ways people live their lives. Mm -hmm. So that brought me to anthropology. And Margaret Mead brought me to film through anthropology as a way of capturing stories. And, and I thought, well, actually, I would have some meaning in life, being able to share stories and break down the barriers between our differences, you know, so that it's a, an understanding that we're all us, we're all the same. So when I was when I was at Columbia, I took a lot of film courses, and and uh, um, Leo Hurwitz came to speak, and he was head of the graduate film school at NYU then, and uh, I spoke to him afterwards, and he said, "Well, what do you want to do with your life? Why don't you come to grad school and become a filmmaker?" Because mm -hmm. at that time, I had made a little film for my my thesis, my undergraduate thesis. I was studying. I had bought a Bolex, and I was filming the difference between the way deaf children play in a playground and hearing children. And it was for a, a linguistics, a kinesiology course. Mm -hmm. And so I was just, so I made this little film and he said, look at your little film. You're a filmmaker. I said, I am. I got into grad school and the rest is history. You mentioned, you know, early in your career and studying pre-med and being too emotional of in, inside that field. Um, and now you're working with a lot of social activism, doing projects that touch on sensitive t topics. What do you do to kind of alleviate some of those um, heavy topics? Well, I do two things, mm -hmm. mainly. I meditate mm -hmm. every day. I begin my day with meditating and I cry a lot. I just cry a lot. I cry a lot. I do every day. I try not to. Yeah. Um, but but I every day I and and that 
makes me, you know, it confirms that I would not have been a good doctor because I feel the pain. I cannot stop feeling the pain. But it's that that drives me to capture these stories. And I'm so, I so love everyone that I've filmed and I've become, you know, there's schools of thought that you're not supposed to do that, but that's not the kind of filmmaking I do. These, these are, are acts of, of love. Mm -hmm. And um, I just love all the people I've been filming all these years. I want their stories to be told. It's a little bit like what, what J.R., do you know the, the French artist J.R.? He's a, a filmmaker and an artist. And he made a film with, with, uh, with Agnes Varda, who is my absolute hero. But he, he goes around, and uh, among other things, but what he's doing, he makes, goes to these different villages in France, and he makes, he has a truck, and he makes these giant pictures, giant photographs of the people who live in the village. I mean, giant building size. And then he papers all the buildings with their images. And then the people in the village come out, and they see themselves, and they see themselves as the size of a building and they see themselves together and the, it's so empowering. Mm -hmm. And he started doing that in prisons also. I think the only way to change, I think we're so un, undeveloped as humans, our race is, <laughs> the race is so under evolved, but I think we, we have to change the way people look at themselves and the way they look at each other. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's what Harry always said, you know, when I asked him, how, how do we, get to hearts and minds of the people on the other side. How do we do that? He said, we have to recognize our common humanity, whatever you can do to help recognize that common humanity. Otherwise you'll never change anything. Mm -hmm. And so I think that uh, being able to tell these stories and allow the people I film to be part of the storytelling, not a subject, but really be a part of it and be emotionally connected to them. And to and they to the story uh, helps that so helps empower people. Very powerful. And you've been working with Harry for so many years, including your first film with him, and now um, experience such a tremendous loss. You're also working on a film with for Diane Carroll. I wanted to ask you. Uh, it's all connected. <laughs> yeah, it's all connected, and she's also a tremendous loss that we've you know, witnessed, how are you coping with to such uh, close people that you worked with? How are you coping? Well, well, Diane Carroll, I started working with as she was dying. Wow. I didn't really know her before. I knew her daughter very well. I know her daughter very well, Suzanne Kay. We were very good friends mm -hmm. and we uh, would talk often. We would get together for lunch and, and talk about our children and talk about uh, our daughters especially and she would talk about her relationship with her mother which was a difficult one mm -hmm. and then as, as uh, her mother became you know closer to death I said to her you know you really have to make peace with your mother mm -hmm. and because uh, she had asked me in the past if I wanted to help her make a film about her mother and I said you know I don't want to keep on running into this situation of a white person making telling another black story i said i don't want to do that anymore it's i never thought about it before but now i'm so conscious of it and i i will help but i don't think i should be the one to do it and she said well you're the only one because we're so close she and i uh, suzanne also named suzanne and i so that uh, i wouldn't trust someone else with the story and uh, so i can't we kind of let it go and then when her mother was uh, really in hospice in her home, I said to Suzanne, I'm not talking about making a film about your mother, but I would like to film you having a conversation with your mother, if, you're, if Diane would agree. I think you need that because I think you have so many complex feelings. And when you sit down to talk to her on the edge of her deathbed, basically, uh, you won't remember any of it. And I think you should have that. You should just have that moment because I think you're going to miss a lot of the love she has for you. It just won't be there, you know, in your mind. Just, so, so Diane agreed. So we filmed over two days and it was just remarkable. I mean, D Diane would, would uh, um, smell Suzanne's arm, you know, and Suzanne would say, what are you doing? And she said, you smell like me. 
which is such a, all that love and that connection and forget about all the other stuff. You smell like me, you're part of me. You know, so there were moments like that. That, so that what that film is about is the hidden diary of Diane Carroll. Because after Diane passed, Suzanne found a hidden diary of her mom's. And so the film is the hidden diary. That's what it is. It all comes there. back into circle moment with, I don't, with, not to give too much away, um, with what was discovered at the end of following Harry as well. Like, how did that change your emotions as well? Were you aware of that letter? Or? That letter was a surprise. Yeah. yeah. Did you like the ending? I loved it. It was so heartfelt. <laughs> like, how was that for you emotionally when you heard the, um, what was included in that letter? How did you feel emotionally? Well, the, the letter just pierced my heart. Mm. It just... And 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 every time I watch that scene, mm-hmm. I just involuntarily just get choked on. Yeah. It's just, you know, because it's it's a letter to Harry, not from Harry, but mm-hmm. it's about his effect, and and that's what's so important: the effect that you can have on the universe. You can do something like that, mm-hmm. of have somebody who was so the exact opposite do that, have that turnaround in a split second just from hearing what you had to say. And film has that power too. In 90 minutes, you can just change the whole worldview of a person as long as they're feeling it. You know, if you're just feeding information, it's one thing. And so, you know, I can be accused of being too emotional in my films. I'm not in the film, never, never. <laughs> but that the film is, is emotional, but it's not, it's not I don't, I'm not playing on people's feelings. Yeah. It just takes you by surprise. And and uh, I really just cut it by the way it surprised me. That's that's how I did it. The, the emotion in it is how I was experiencing. I believe that poets are the ones that rearrange how we start to engage with the world, how we start to formulate ideas and imagine the world around us. And I wrote this piece going into a lot of halfway houses and um, substance abuse programs and prisons, and here we go. The young know no boundaries. We quake the earth under our tongues and spit whirlwinds for lynch pendulums of our yesterdays. Dream for better days. Sometimes mothers free hummingbirds from their rib cage and they don't always learn the art of flying. So deep is our moral collapse we no longer seem to have real regard for what we're doing to our children, what we're doing to those generations yet unborn. What are we really leaving them? 